myself, I repeat myself. This is the part where I repeat myself, I repeat myself. I'm sorry. This is the part where I, I repeat myself, I repeat myself, I repeat myself. Ayla Brooke and the Soundmen rapping up beautifully, absolutely perfectly. I'd like to say we planned that, but you didn't have your headphones on yet, so you didn't actually even know where the song was at. Well, you don't know that. Oh, you don't know that. Yeah, you could have you heard I mean, it. Maybe I did, maybe I did. Okay, well, you're a little psychic. That's maybe fine. <laughs> no, actually, I could vaguely, I could, I could gently hear it coming through the headphones as they hung on the mic stand here. Oh, okay. And, uh, and I thought, you know, most folks, 95% of our listening audience w- will catch or watch this Sam. Um, uh, outside of our live broadcast hours as we kick off at 8.30 Mountain, 10.30 a.m. Eastern every weekday morning. But for those that tune in live, th- these these are the little things we do, the little steps we take, the little efforts we make to keep it as tight as possible as a live presented product. A good Thursday morning to you all. Thank you for being here. How the heck are you this morning? You got your, I feel like every single day you're going to come in here in a, in a beautifully tied tie with your collar up to the top. Yeah, and, and then you're going to make me and, take it off, right? And then real talkers will demand that you lose the tie and I, pop the collar. I and, the tie. I don't know. Well, How am I doing good. today? You look fantastic, I wrote Sam. 2025 on the date on my notes and I don't know why. 2025? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm confused as well. So, what you, like, What do you think will be different in your life by 2025? Oh boy! Um, I will. I will. I will still be sitting in this. We'll have a bigger studio. I think that's what will be different in my life by 2025. Yeah, you like not it. to say that this is a small studio, but it's a small studio. Yes, I like it. The real talkers are showing up on mass this morning. So how does this work? Because you keep being, you're the one that keeps an eye on our live chat for the most part to make sure. It looks like there were a couple rabble rousers in there yesterday. By the way, for anybody that watches our YouTube. Uh, whether it's live or later in the day, and you see that chat unfold, you'll see that you were. I don't know if I should be laughing because I don't actually know what the subject matter was. We don't have to get into it, but I noticed you you had you you were repeatedly muting uh, who proved someone who proved to be a repeat offender yesterday. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, I I try to sort of gently like time them out and mute them first, and and just sort of give them the nudge, being like, hey, let's let's tone your comments down a little bit, but. Sometimes they just have to go. And like I said, I mean, there's some people that just come in and try and throw. I have no problem with dissenting opinion on the chat. It's no. when they just try to take over and push a different narrative. That's when I'm like, okay, you're not you're not contributing to the yeah. discussion. Some random guy in the discussion. Um, that, that's the handle. That's not me dismissing the person. Um, I, it says 2025 is the year that Sam will predict that this pandemic will actually be over at this rate, uh, which which might be an intuitive comment. Yesterday. We saw some interesting developments as we were coming to you live. We saw that uh, here in our home province of Alberta, RCMP, we're assisting Alberta Health Services uh, in in a provision or a statute, whatever you call it. I'm not a lawyer. You might be able to tell. Um, I think it was Section 62.1 of of the Alberta Public Health Act, uh, which basically says uh, in layperson's terms, yeah, we can put a fence around your property if you continue to be a problem. That, That in layperson's terms is basically what it said. And so now this church west of Edmonton has a has a fence around it and roadblocks and there, there's uh, law enforcement on site, which I'm sure is exactly what police officers feel like doing. Um, and I'm sure that members of the greater community are absolutely thrilled that the officers aren't out solving crimes or keeping the streets safe, uh, instead sitting around a church that refuses to keep their capacity at 15%. It's what it's what 
this event is turning into, though, or, or what it's facilitating or what it's making possible that I think concerns me even more. Uh, of course, yesterday the pastor was there, as you would say, as they would say, you know, the, the shepherd is here for his flock. Of course he showed up while his church was being boarded up, especially when there's news cameras, right? Because he already did the time. He already did the jail time. So that's, that's you know, step number one is, is defy legal authorities. Right. Step number one is 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 as a as a minister of the as a man of the cloth, as a minister, obviously break the law brazenly and encourage all of your followers, uh, your congregants, to do the same thing. So that's step number one. Number two is do time, um, sit in jail, make sure that it's for a meaningful amount of time. So the headlines spread. So they start talking. So Tucker Carlson and all the other sane commentators on, on things like Fox news, outlets like Fox start talking about you and celebrating you and, and start invoking, you know, uh, sort of, you know, comparisons to, to some of the horrific regimes throughout history and comparing them to the Alberta government. That's step number two. And then step number three is after you get out of jail, make sure you follow up. And of course, put your face in front of as many TV cameras as possible. So the pastor out there is doing a great job um, when it comes to securing his book deal uh, and achieving prosperity, uh, which means getting rich on the backs of a story that is being spun as a story about freedom of religion. But of course, we know it's not about freedom of religion at all, is it? And you're telling us. And 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 of course, the, the emails that jump out to us are the, are the ones from churchgoers, those are the ones that matter most because the pastors here or or some of the the uh, the high profile media darlings across Canada that all uh, immediately as soon as they could. Uh, and I'm assuming maybe maybe on their on their taxpayer supported government credit cards. I'm assuming I'm not sure. Derek Sloan, the, the MP, uh, was, was, was into Western Canada pretty quick yesterday. As soon as those fence started going up, he was there doing live Facebook events and turning it into a fundraising event. So are some of the, the other independent right wing media outlets in Canada they're all there and they're going to make a lot of money from this as well it's a great opportunity for people looking to make money um but a lot of church going folks outside of this community outside of this church congregation aren't thrilled about it like Sheldon who wrote into the show yesterday to talk at ryanjesperson.com this was as the fences were going up and he, he said you know what he said it's about time somebody shut down Grace Life Church he says, zero sympathy from me. Our family hasn't been to our church for like a year, just like most actual Christians, says Sheldon. What I don't understand is why Alberta Health Services has to deal with these jerks on their own. I mean, shouldn't their occupancy permits, their development permits, he said it's a new building, their business license, shouldn't this all be canceled due to violation of these laws? Sheldon's on to something. You may remember it came up in a past show. The municipality had every uh, option to, to pull this business license, too. There are a number of different ways you can go about this. Sheldon says, like, where's the county on this? And what, what about their insurance? I mean, shouldn't their insurance be canceled as well? He said, I'm pretty sure that if I consistently and publicly break the law running my business, my insurance company would tell me to take a hike. And what about the bank, says Sheldon? I mean, assuming that they have a mortgage on this fancy new building, canceled insurance in my world, says Sheldon, means a canceled mortgage. He says at some point, a real plan of action needs to be developed to enforce the law in this country. And clearly, public health orders are not enforceable. And that's an even bigger problem. And as for the religious right, he's not talking about on the spectrum. He's talking about freedoms. Let's call it religious freedoms. He says that's just offensive. This is Sheldon. This is a church going guy. He says half the country is losing its job or forced to close their businesses. And you guys really are trying to spin this as about religion. I mean, how self-centered do you have to be to present it like that? Sheldon says, I'm exhausted with rules and restrictions. And it seems to me that some days I barely even care anymore. But you know what? Rules are rules. And if you break the law, you should face the consequence, period. This should be no different. That from Sheldon, who's all fired up. I appreciate that to talk at ryanjesperson.com. We'll get to more of your emails today. They're, they're not all about Grace Life Church. They're, they're about curriculum and they're, and they're about COVID and they're about social media. We're going to have a, I'm going to call it what it's going to, it's going to be a heavy conversation today and an, and an absolutely important one. As members of the Jewish faith uh, around the world today, we'll observe Yom HaShoah. It's a very somber day of, 
of, of remembrance, a day of mourning, and in a certain context, I think, a day of hope. And so we've put together an impromptu Real Talk roundtable. doesn't matter that it's not Friday. And coming up in, a, in about a half hour's time, we're going to talk about why this day is so important. We'll talk about the rise of, of incidents of anti-Semitism that we've seen in the world. We're going to talk about some of the initiatives that we're seeing across Canada. I think it's going to be a good conversation. Before that, we're going to talk to Dr. James Talbot, intended to join us yesterday, had to send his regrets last minute. He's Alberta's former chief medical officer of health. He's still prominently involved in public health in Alberta. That's coming up in just a minute. Let me remind you that we're able to bring you this show every day because we've got the great support of our presenting sponsor, Bitcoin Well. As a matter of fact, I'm looking forward to checking in with the team at Bitcoin. Well, I told you I'm a tiny little player. I'm like this tiny little minnow. I'm like, Sam, minnows are in, they're in lakes, right? They're in ponds, lakes. Yeah, you what, use them for bait for other fish. What would be, what would be like, yeah, I, I'm not sure if I like that part of the metaphor. Okay, fine. But, no, but you're totally <laughs> right. You're totally right. Uh, what would be the biggest body of water a minnow would be in? Like oh, probably maybe just, like Slave Lake? Probably like, a big lake. Like just a big, big lake. Yeah. So I am like one minnow in, in Slave Lake. When it when it comes to crypto, okay, have I if I represent? I, I'm not a big shot. I'm not a big player, but I'm intrigued by it, and so I get my advice from the team at Bitcoin. Well, and some of my questions, I mean, some of you would be like, "Really? This guy's a professional question asker, and these are his questions? No dumb questions at Bitcoin." Well, you can find them under the sponsors tab at RyanJesperson.com. Real talk starts right now. Here's Ryan Jesperson. We've got a, a whole bunch of you on the live chat, uh, including Heidi, uh, talking about this letter of dissent that came out yesterday. Uh, I think it was at first 15, and then I saw a 16th, and then maybe more uh, United Conservative MLAs, rural MLAs, stepping up and actually sort of calling out their government, basically calling out the government for some of the measures for the for the return to so-called stage one as we see this third wave of COVID, including these p1 variants of concern becoming more of an issue in the province we have extended some issues to some of uh, some invitations i should say extended invitations to several of the mlas that signed that list and and some of them got back to us and just said we've said what we're going to say uh we signed the letter uh we've called out the government and then i've seen some some pretty harsh words aimed at those mlas from from people i saw uh shauna on twitter a while ago uh shauna garlic said 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 uh you know you know what they should do is every mla should commit to spending one overnight in the icu do like a job shadow with an icu physician and see if that changes their mind on how they feel about all this it's got people talking businesses are are, are, are getting set to shut down or, or significantly dial back um, their offerings their capacity again restaurants are now closing for in-dining service gyms are closing except for if there's a personal trainer there and, it, and it's a one-on-one -on -one type scenario i'm curious to know how you feel about that that seems to be one that people identify and, and kind of hone in on it shows us that as, as exhausted as we may be including that email from Sheldon there. He says, listen, I'm exhausted. He says, some days I don't even care. He says, but rules are rules. Public health officials are pleading, saying, hey, listen, these variants of concern are more contagious, more contagious than what we've seen through this pandemic. They're impacting younger people. We have to start having conversations about long COVID. And so, of course, all of this comes back to Alberta's premier, to Alberta's health minister, and to Alberta's chief medical officer of health. We talked a little bit yesterday, uh, including with Edson Mayor Kevin Zahara, about what it's been like for some of these communities, the communities where this, this outbreak, the outbreak of these variants of concern have become a factor. Edson is one of those communities. And the mayor talked to us, if you missed the interview yesterday, about how frustrated he was with the messaging. That all started with the chief medical officer of health, Dr. Dina Hinshaw, over the weekend, who said, Albertans should know we're investigating something. We're investigating an outbreak uh, impacting several Alberta communities in several workplaces, but that was it for details, and it didn't fly with a lot of folks. We thought, I should say including me, we thought it might be valuable to check in with somebody who's walked in these shoes many miles, as a matter of fact. He served as Alberta's chief medical officer of health, and he continues his involvement in public health right now as the co-chair of the Edmonton Zone Medical Staff Association, Dr. James Talbot. We're grateful you've made time for us this morning, and welcome to Real Talk. 
Well, thanks so much for having me, and I apologize again for what happened yesterday. Hey, this 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 is a this is a live show, and things happen, and. And, you know, we don't we don't like every pitch that we face, just like in life. So here you are. You're back in the batter's box, and I should stop the sports metaphors there so we can talk health. Uh, what do you make? I mean, generally speaking, why don't we get into specifics, and then we'll widen our lens. But Alberta's Chief Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Dina Hinshaw, over the weekend, some details confirming that there are serious outbreaks, confirming that AHS is looking into it. But that's where it stopped. You've done this job before. Take us into the psyche or the thinking behind a post or a message like that. Well, I mean, first of all, Dr. Hinshaw is one of the finest physicians, the finest public health physicians I've ever worked with. I and mean, she's been a terrific leader through all of this. But this is a once in a hundred years threat. And, you know, the odds that we're going to get everything right are, are not good. Um, I think in general, without speaking about the specifics, that um, you know, the people who are really controlling what happens with the virus is every single Albert. It, it, you know, to bring it under control takes millions of people literally making good decisions. And when that's your team, it's really important to have good communications. And that those communications need to be timely, they need to be accurate, and they need to be useful. They need to be giving things uh, uh, that people can do something about. And, uh, and, you know, I think that um, the communications on the weekend didn't quite meet that standard, but they did move in their defense pretty quickly at the beginning of the week. Can you help us understand, I mean, this might seem like an obvious question, but but what the mandate is, you might even say, what's the job description of, of the chief medical officer of health? Because a lot of folks are, 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 are kind of curious, I think, with regards to, you know, where the power lies and what options are available to a chief medical officer of health. What's the job? Sure. Well, the act, uh, of course, is pretty comprehensive and complicated, but it distills down to this. The major responsibility of the chief medical officer of health is provi to provide advice to the minister and to the government around issues that involve uh, preventing disease, promoting health, and prolonging life. And the mandate is pretty broad. So it's not restricted to just uh, organisms like the COVID virus. It includes things like asbestos or, or lead. Uh, it includes uh, you know, making sure that the air we breathe, the water that we drink, the food that we eat is safe. So, uh, and it includes strengthening communities to be better able to withstand threats. Um, so it's primarily to advise. It, it, uh, there is a subsection of the act that allows broad ranging emergency powers of the kind that you saw being used with Grace Life. Those powers are under the act, as you mentioned, and they include taking whatever measure, measures are necessary to uh, deal with the threat to a community. This, uh, have you ever seen, I mean, have you been in a scenario yourself where you, uh, and, and I, let me be careful here before I ask you the question, let me just say something. It is not my place to imply or to assume that Dr. Dina Hinshaw is at loggerheads with the provincial government, with the premier's office, with the health minister, uh, in no way, shape or form. Has she ever communicated that to me? I can only speculate. We can ruminate, we can chew the fat, but I want to be careful when I ask you certain questions, like, did you ever find yourself in a position where you were, you know, quarreling or disagreeing with or failing to see eye to eye with political leadership in the province? I, I'm not necessarily implying that that's the case here, but I will say that over the weekend, when I essentially said it's preposterous, it's preposterous that they're not releasing details about where this outbreak is, uh, I, I received significant correspondence from legitimate people. And what I mean by that is people in positions of health leadership in the province, privately and off the record, that said, please lay off Dr. Hinshaw. Please understand she's doing what she can please understand there's so much advocacy behind the scenes. Please understand you're not seeing everything. And it resonated with me to a certain degree. So we'll get into that in a second. But, but did you ever find yourself in a position where, where as, as, as the top doc in the province, political leadership and you, you just didn't see eye to eye? Uh, many times. I, I mean, you asked, 
what the powers under the act are, one of the core competencies is uh, of the job is being able to speak the truth to power. And um, and I don't want to make a big deal, but this isn't about personal animosity. A lot of times, you know, public health will create a tension between what we need to do to protect people's health and what's good for the economy. Or it could be that uh, people want to do something in the environment, which is going to benefit, uh, you know, some aspect of industry, but which is potentially going to cause a threat to people's health. Uh, there are agricultural practices that sometimes uh, by themselves in their own se sector make perfect sense, but which also potentially represent a risk to health. So uh, it is not uncommon to have those kinds of, of, of uh, tensions in government between the chief medical officer health and other branches of government. You know, you for things like immunization, in the past, for certain vaccines, there have been tensions between various religious groups and, and public health. So it's part of the job to recognize that that tension is going to exist and, and try to keep the story about uh, doing what's best for the majority of people and, and moving forward with that. Do you get the sense that Dr. Hinshaw and, and the policy that she's, uh, well, I should say the premier's announcing the policy, the health minister announces policy, but, but Dr. Hinshaw speaks to Albertans. Do you get the sense that she would go further as a doctor, uh, as a scientist? Do you get the sense that, that maybe there's some compromise here? Do you get the sense that maybe she's not fully implementing policy that she'd like to see? I think that she has, uh, made this point a number of times and I know I have that in the end the job is to provide the advice and what the government chooses to do with it in a democratically elected system is the final word. Uh, if you're asking me do I have any doubts that Dr. Hinshaw has been giving the best possible advice uh, I have none. I, I believe uh, I've known Dina for at least 20 years and she is exactly, I mean, the reason you got that feedback on the weekend is that she comes across as exactly who she is. She's smart. She's resilient. She's compassionate. She's a very decent human being. And that's why I think you might have gotten some people who wanted to make very clear to you that, that they value, value her highly. Yeah. Well, and let me say this, uh, you know, someone said to me, uh, you know, oh, wow. You know, here you are, um, and and they had to throw in a little dig, Doc. They knew they, they they said a minor celebrity. I thought a minor celebrity. I mean, geez, at least at least a local celebrity, at least. But they said, oh, a minor celebrity calls for the resignation of the chief medical officer of health. I said, as a matter of fact, that's not that's not what I called for. Um, and and I blame you, Doctor Talbot. I blame you because I read I read a piece about you in the CBC a while ago where you said, based on your experience, you said a chief medical officer of health has three options. Uh, if you disagree with government, you said you can quit, you can be fired. In other words, you can speak out and, and inevitably be fired or you can work behind the scenes. And what I said, technically, I called on Dr. Hinshaw to tell Albertans where the outbreaks were. And I said, and if she can't, then I think on principle she should resign. What do you make of it? So I did say those three options and I did cover exactly what you're talking about, which is that um, in general, those um, things happen in a kind of time limited place, you know, an uh, outbreak associated with uh, food or a restaurant. And that goes on for a couple of weeks, at most a couple of months. And so, uh, you know, resigning or being fired, uh, that might be something that you're prepared to do. But the key thing about being a medical officer of health at any level is that you're there for your community. And the question that you have to ask, and I, particularly in something like this that's gone on for a year, is, is the community better off with me in that position or are they not? And, and I think if you look across the country, there are, uh, my colleagues are amongst the finest human beings I've ever worked with. Not one of them has resigned. And I can guarantee that none of them got everything that they asked for. But in the end, uh, you saw what happened in the United States with um, the person who replaced Anthony Fauci, who started pushing for herd immunity so that many more people ended up dying on his watch. 
you know, I'm sure that Dr. Faustin, when he goes back to take a look at that decision, is going to ask himself, would it have been better if I stayed? And so uh, the other two are options, you know, quitting or being uh, or being fired, resigning or being fired. But in a crisis like this, you have to be really sure and that have to be really, really critical before you take that step. So you've got uh, um, and, and, and again, I don't I don't uh, want to you know dismiss the very real concerns in, in some cases, the, the, the life altering reality that there are for, for business owners and entrepreneurs and folks. And I don't have to get into the, the many ways that that returning to stage one or certain shutdown measures have. Um, on people's lives. That's very real and it's very legitimate and it's, and it certainly needs to be on our radar. But realistically speaking, we are not in a lockdown. We've never been in a lockdown. Uh, Ontario introduces the, the stay-at-home order, uh, Premier Doug Ford announcing that. We talked to Dr. Keshef uh, Pirzada yesterday out of Toronto, an ER doc. He's one of the co-founders of Masks for Canada and Conquer COVID-19. And he says, listen, he says, Alberta... Right now, he said, as a matter of fact, he said Western Canada, he said nobody is taking steps to shut down some of the, he didn't say super spreaders, but he basically said jam-packed workplaces is one example. He said, and until Alberta gets serious about that, this, this third wave is going to continue to happen and this is going to continue to be a problem. You know, so we've got, we've got health specialists, we've got some health law scholars that are saying, listen, um, the Provincial Public Health Acts not only allow for the independence of the chief medical officer of health to, to implement policies or to make decisions that they believe would be in the best interest of protecting the population. Not only that, not only is there a provision, but there's also a moral or, or an ethical imperative um, as a physician to act to protect health. Are they wrong or are they right? Well, let's take a look at the specifics of where we are in Alberta. The, um, the committee that I co-chair had been recommending that we open up, uh, reopen more slowly and to pay attention to, to measures other than hospitalization. Um, the decision was made to reopen and to create situations in which super spreader events could happen. And we've seen those happen in meatpacking plants. We've seen them happen with restaurants and bars. Um, and we've seen them in other venues. So the premier announced uh, that we're going back to a, a, a second wave set of restrictions. We, we've done the modeling on that. And what's changed is the variant. The new variant is uh, driving this wave, the UK variant. And now we have the Brazil variant in the province as well. And it will, it will have a shorter doubling time. It will put more people in the hospital than the original one did, and uh, it will put the system under stress much faster than uh, we saw in the second wave. And so when we do the modeling to take a look at what happens if we go back to the second wave and everybody uh, does what was announced uh, perfectly, we slow down the spread of the variant, but it doesn't come down. We don't bend the curve. We slow it down which is good because it buys us some time, but it's not enough to bring the caseloads down. And the only thing that will bring the caseloads down is something like what we saw in the first wave, more of a concerted shutdown. And you can call it what you want, lockdown, shutdown, provincial stay at home orders. You know, in Quebec, which has got a lot of bad uh, experience with the original virus that we were fortunate enough because of Dr. Hinshaw's leadership to avoid, um, they've moved to actual curfews, you know, where people just aren't allowed to leave through the house through certain hours. And so, you know, th I, I, this isn't personal. This isn't one group against another group. The, the virus doesn't really care. All the virus wants to do is make copies of itself. And if that causes people to be sick or die, the virus doesn't care. And so what I would say to the uh, MLAs who signed that letter is to say, okay, well, your hypothesis is that the, what the premier announced was overkill. So let's wait a week to two weeks. That's how long it's going to take to double. And let's see what happens to the numbers. And if you're right, and if it was overkill, we'll see the numbers drop precipitously. And then everybody who criticized you can apologize. But if the numbers continue to go up, they were not strict enough 
and uh, maybe you need to rethink uh, what your letter said. Is it is it a tougher gig to be a a chief medical officer of health in a province like Alberta than in a province like BC? I mean, I, I you know I see I, I see Randy Hillier, the the conservative. Uh, MPP, he's he's independent. I should clarify. It was Doug Ford kicked him out of caucus, but but Randy Hillier last week during Passover, as a matter of fact, invoked Nazi imagery of Adolf Hitler and talked about the Third Lockdown and the Third Reich, and I mean just the most obtuse, idiotic, offensive uh, take that I've seen in a long time. Um, you know, you've got health officials putting a, a fence around a church and, and, and the next thing you know, rebel media is there and you got NP Derek Sloan's there and people are banging drums about how, you know, in some way it's socialism. And I, I just wish so many people didn't drop out of grade four social studies. But, you know, you, you have this sort of there's this real political infusion and there's this real sense of freedom and how these public health measures impact our or, or step on the toes of our freedom. Is it tougher here to do the job? You know, it's a, a true of public health everywhere that if you end up in the news, um, I've got some kind of problems with alert going on, but um, <laughs> if public health ends up in the news. Do you have news back- to announce? Is, is there a, if there's a province wide alert, you can announce it right now. We could scoop everybody else, Doc. You could let us know we're live. No, it's an Ontario province. Okay, right? okay. So, um, <laughs> sorry about that. So, you know, it says in public health, whenever we're on the news, it's almost guaranteed to be a bad news situation. I, I, I would say that I'll, every province is unique. I enjoyed the experience of public health in Alberta. I enjoyed it because there are certain values that Albertans hold that just resonate strongly with public health. And, and one of them is fairness. It doesn't matter whether you're rural or urban or liberal or conservative or NDP. You know, uh, Albertans are very strong on the idea that you should be fair. And so I just want to go back and revisit the, the church thing. Look, you know, for the last year, people's faiths have sustained them, whether Islam, Buddhism, uh, uh, the Jewish religion, uh, the branches of the Christian uh, denominations, they've been an enormous support uh, uh, to people's mental, emotional, and physical health because they have helped out feeding people in the community at the very least uh, uh, of what they've done. And they've been an enormous support. And they have, all of them, the vast majority, done exactly what needed to be done to help at every stage. All right? And so I, you know, I could choose to concentrate on the few who are endangering their community and and damaging their reputation. Or you can choose to concentrate on the fact that, you know, there are Islamic mosques, Jewish synagogues, Hindu and Buddhist temples, and uh, Catholic and Protestant churches that every day are doing the right thing in the province. And I think sometimes we lose that perspective. Yeah, I agree with you 100 percent. I mean, you know, I read an email. I'm sure you heard it right before we introduced you from a church going audience member um, who's who's ticked off at at essentially the fact that they're doing this in the name of freedom of religion. That was what upset them most. I've I've got some more candid uh, comments from friends. Uh, people of faith yesterday that I, I think that they were intended to be kept private, but let's just say they've all got a B in their bonnet uh, because they feel like the community uh, is being smeared by the actions of these very few. My take on this, uh, it doesn't matter to me if it's a church or a nightclub or, or whatever it is. Uh, it could be a water polo team. If people continue to gather and defiantly you know, and brazenly sort of uh, you know, s- you know, snub their noses at public health restrictions, I think that action has to be taken or what? Right. I mean, you know, I'm just learning how to parent. We've just got a five year old and I'm already understanding what happens if you lose even just a tiny little bit of ground. They gain that ground and then they never seed it again. And you got to be careful. You got to be firm. Uh, let me ask you this question from a physician that that, that wants to remain uh, anonymous. They say, that, you know, that in public health, what 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 you call the determinants. They said these contributing factors much more broad than personal health practices, issues like the overdose epidemic occupational injury, childhood obesity, wonders this doctor, how much damage do you think, uh, Dr. Talbot, it's doing to public health that is the province's top 
public health physician, Dr. Hinshaw continues to emphasize personal responsibility over social policy and health authority action as we see the death toll from COVID climb into the 2000s. So I'm going to take this a little bit further back just to get some perspective. In Canada, there was a public health before there was a Canada. Uh, you know, pe- ships would come in infected in ports like Montreal and Halifax. And uh, people would start to die in the town. And they would notice that the people who lived in the poorer parts of town would die. That This is before the germ theory or anything else. And so they would, but it, once enough poor people died, it started to be a problem for the merchants in town. And so they would appoint a physician and they would create isolation quarantine. Uh, this is back in the 1700s. And then after it was over, they would allow the, the act to lapse and they would go back and pretend as if nothing had happened and it would continue to, like that to the next cholera outbreak. And every time you go back and look at it, they're stunned to find out that people of lower socioeconomic status die in larger numbers. Back then they explained it in a way as you know, weakness of character. That's, that's what was responsible. So I I would look at the present day and say that, yeah, I am concerned that we've lost track of the fact that right now um, we should be putting more resources into immunizing people in communities that are low socioeconomic. And if you're in Edmonton and Calgary, you can name which communities those are and that we should be doing something to make sure that there's extra effort to make sure they're safe. We have people who aren't making uh, much above minimum wage working in uh, industries that are vital for our economy and for our health, like the meat packing plants, where there are still outbreaks occurring. And we need to think seriously about immunizing those workers at risk because they truly are essential workers and they're putting their lives on online for us. And in the long term, you know, you take a look at some of the outbreaks that happened in Edmonton and Calgary. You had people who were working minimum wage who ha- could only afford to be in houses that were overcrowded and then uh, were multi-generational, and on top of that, uh, were working for minimum wage. And so you would have people who were working in a meat packing plant coming back into a house that was overcrowded, working with, with uh, eating and, and living with someone who was working in a long-term care facility. Now, none of this is rocket science. None of it's unpredictable. None of it requires fancy modeling or you know, electron microscopes to figure out. But we have to have the will between uh, pandemics or epidemics or natural disasters. We have to have the will to improve the determinants of health, particularly for the, the communities that are the most vulnerable. And there's nothing stopping us doing that. And that obviously includes but is not limited to our indigenous populations. It's worth pointing out, as a matter of fact, I was going to mention this in a, in a, a newscast coming up later, but, but Alberta does intend, this was announced a short time ago, to, to offer vaccines to about 2,000 uh, meatpacking employees at their work site this month. And it's being described as an effort to target citizens most at risk of contracting the coronavirus and those who might otherwise struggle to access or to accept shots? I'm assuming from your body language, you think that that's an intuitive move. Uh, I don't know intuitive, but it's a smart move. (laughs) Okay, that's a great answer. Uh, Let me ask you this, Doc. The the time that we've asked you for is up, and I know you've got a lot on your plate. Um, This is a great email from Colin. Uh, Just received it. He says, please ask Dr. Talbot. He's got stars all over it, so it caught our attention. Uh, he says, he says, I'm thrilled to see Dr. Talbot on the show today. Apologies for the last minute email. Please ask him to outline the role. Doc, I'm reading this cold, by the way, so I don't even know how the email ends. But he says, ask him to outline the role that he played and the barriers that he faced in getting naloxone to be publicly available in Alberta while he was the chief medical officer of health. He put his career on the line to advocate for people in need to save lives. Basically, he was let go because he found the money to save the lives of so-called drug addicts and the government didn't like the optics this is leadership and it is what we've been sorely lacking across the country during the pandemic pardon my french but colin says dr talbot's a fucking beauty his courage should be applauded and it's no wonder he's such a strong advocate now for taking an evidence-informed approach with the pandemic in alberta i'm glad to see him on real talk that from colin would you tell us the story to wrap this conversation um yeah, as long as I can tell one quick one after. Um, yeah. So Colin is clearly 
an inside baseball fan, uh, the story is pretty close to what he said. We were early in recognizing the threat that fentanyl was uh, posing, and we had those. We were following the statistics as a big part of what the chief MOH's job was. We sounded the alarm early um, and started to work on um, creating a short, medium, long-term plan. And the short term was to get locks zone out to as many uh, people as would come in contact with the population at risk. And I was told that there was no money and so we should stop those efforts. And I, as I mentioned before, that one of the things that makes it more difficult to be an LLH is you have to you have to sign an oath, the Hippocratic Oath, and it says that you will not, through action or inaction, allow harm to happen. So we continued to work on the plan, found the money for it, rolled it out in record time. And um, the last interview I had with the senior official in the ministry indicated that uh, in an unrelated way, one, my contract wasn't going to be renewed, and two, they were very disappointed that I had rolled out a program that I had been expressly told there was no money for. So uh, the day that I walked out uh, was the day the first reports came back on, the, at that point, dozens, now thousands of people whose lives had been saved by the program. So I, I walked out with my head high. Doctor, when would that have been? Uh, that <laughs> just go back and Google the end of my career. <laughs> so here's the story I do want to tell from a personal point of view. I'll keep it short. I I was eligible for the vaccine and I got it at the first chance I got. I got AstraZeneca and uh, I'm not particularly concerned about the side effects in my age group. And I got a single dose and, you know, I'm in the business, so I thought I was prepared. I wasn't. I had three emotions wash over me in rapid succession. You know, the first emotion was just relief. You know, I'm still going to do the same precautions I've been doing. But now if I make a mistake or something unexpected happens, I have an extra level of protection. So I'm relieved. The second feeling I had was just overwhelming gratitude, you know, to the vaccine manufacturers, to the people who got the vaccine into my arm, to the people who kept me safe until the vaccine uh, could arrive. You know, I was just so grateful. But the one I didn't expect was the sense of guilt that, you know, I felt like there are lots of other people out there that are being left behind. There are lots of people who need to be protected. Just think about the younger people who've kept the, uh, you know, the supply chains going, who've been taking care of uh, children who've been responsible for, you know, getting the food and supplies out to people's homes. And as Albertans, I said before, there's a resonance with, uh, I feel, with people in Alberta, and one is about fairness. But the second is this, we don't leave jobs half done. It doesn't matter whether you're a farmer or in the oil industry or rancher, a teacher, a public servant, that's not the Alberta way. We don't do things halfway and just abandon them. So, you know, my message to people is let's just stay at this until we can get the job done, until everybody is safe. That's I, the Alberta way. I appreciate that, doctor. Um I have to circle back because this isn't sitting right with me and I have to I have to make sense that you knew I was going to do a little you, you knew I was going to. So I'm just I'm doing a little digging and I'm and so so it was announced that you would be stepping down. That's what they call it. Um, I, I guess that's kind of like how I stepped down from terrestrial radio, uh, different circumstances. But uh, th that was in June of 2015. So th th this is under a newly or a recently elected Premier Rachel Notley and an NDP government under with Health Minister Sarah Hoffman that that for all intents and purposes is perceived to be progressive uh, on files, including um, supervised consumption. Um, I won't go so far as to say safe supply, but but certainly um, perceived, I think, by most to be more compassionate and science based on um, on uh, health measures related to the opioid epidemic. Why do you, why do you think it is? I mean, you, you've had now six years to think about it. Why do you think it is that, that you were booted for that under this government? It just doesn't that doesn't make sense to me. I don't think it originated with the NDP government. Uh, it was at the exactly at the transition. Yeah. And so recommendation would have come from the civil service and uh, was what, uh, 
it's hard when you're trying to be honest, but at the same time, you're not trying to make things difficult. So let me take a crack at it this way. Um, th there were people within the ministry, as I said, who were unhappy that I had flout flouted organization protocols to make sure that the program got delivered, was funded, got delivered, and had an impact. And when there's a transition, there's a moment in which the minister that you know, that you've been working with, who has complete trust in you, is no longer in, in, in power. And then there's a moment in which the new minister has no idea who you are. And I now know when I teach residents who are going to be medical officers of the health in the future to tell them to pay attention to the dangers of that particular moment. Yeah, geez. I mean, so many things that you don't think you'll think about uh, when you sign up to practice medicine. I, I'm the son of a physician. Uh, I mean, I can even tell you that, you know, the fact that doctors have to learn how to run businesses too, while they also practice health. And I mean, and then all the political nuance that you would have faced. It's uh, let me just say this. We really appreciate um, your candid approach to this conversation, doc, and the insight into uh, the miles and miles that you walked in the shoes that Dr. Hinshaw is wearing right now. Thanks for this. Uh, my pleasure. And my thanks to everybody in your audience who's going to continue doing the right thing. There you have it. Dr. James Talbot. He's uh, Alberta's former Chief Medical Officer of Health, and uh, he's currently the co-chair of the Edmonton Zone Medical Staff Association. We'll get some of your comments a little bit later on the show. I, that, <clears throat> that story, I'm grateful for Colin's email, and I'm glad that we flagged it, uh, asking to hear the story about that. <clears throat> kind of getting behind the scenes there a little bit, pulling, pulling back the curtain here on Real Talk. Pretty interesting stuff. The team at the Dairy Queens of Northwest Edmonton and Sherwood Park want to remind you that it does not have to cost a fortune to, to, to get out of the house, even if it's just to the drive through You know, head over for five bucks after 8 p.m. every single weeknight. You can mix and match a medium dipped cone, a sundae, or maybe two of each, whatever you like. At those six locations owned by Michael and Mark, great friends of Real Talk, in Northwest Edmonton and Sherwood Park, it's only $5, seven nights a week after 8 p.m. Make sure you check them out and let them know that Real Talk sent you. Want to let you know that the team at Kubi Energy right now is ready for a conversation with you about how solar could change your game. Whether it's the new house you're building, maybe it's a house that you're retrofitting, maybe it's your business, maybe it's a big factory and you're curious to know what different options you might have to go in a more sustainable direction. It is what they do. So they talk to you, they figure it out, they plan it out, and then they install it. They're Tesla certified, and they're proudly headquartered in Edmonton and Kamloops, BC. You can find them online at kubienergy.ca. Also, a big shout out to the team at McBain Camera. We've been so grateful to partner with them over this past month. They've been serving Alberta's photography community since 1949. My purchases at McBain Camera go back 25 years. Sam, I remember the first long lens that I bought at McBain Camera. It was that it was that Canon 75-300 image stabilizer lens. You know that one I'm talking about? Oh, yeah. What a lens. I mean, that was when, when I invested in that lens. That was when I... Because, you know, you get kind of the standard... You buy, like, the body, and then you get the, the 28, 80 millimeter lens. And you can, you can do some all right stuff with that. But investing as a young man, I think I was like 19 in that 75-300 lens. It just changed everything. All of a sudden, you could, you could, I was going to say, you could pick off birds in the trees. I mean, I mean, photos. I mean, photos is what I'm talking about. And I got it at McBain. Uh, they've been, that's what they've been doing. They've been helping photographers maximize their potential for all those years. They've got six Alberta locations. They're ready to serve you safely in-house, or you can live chat with one of their experts at McBainCamera.com. Let's take a quick look at what's making headlines this morning. Well, as we just talked about with Dr. James Talbot, Alberta says it's going to offer vaccines to about 2,000 employees at meat packing plants at their work sites this month. They say that it's a way to ensure that citizens that are most at risk of contracting coronavirus, those who might otherwise struggle to accept or, or even access shots, get the shots they need. So Cargill's High River operation, everybody remembers that. It was the site of still what's proven to be the largest workplace outbreak of COVID-19 in Canada. 
uh, a max vaccination clinic will get started on April 20th and employees at Cargill's case ready facility in Calgary may also be included. I'm sure there are a lot of people are going to hear that story and go, what about at my workplace? I feel at risk. I'm the one working every day. I'd be curious to know your thoughts on that talk at RyanJesperson.com. Dr. Talbot says that move's a smart move. Meantime, Ontario physicians have been urged to ration one of only two drugs known to reduce mortality in critically ill COVID-19 patients. Experts are saying this could be a warning of what could lie ahead for other provinces if this third wave keeps going and Canada cannot secure more of the meds that it needs. These are anti-inflammatories and this could be relevant as BC, Saskatchewan, New Brunswick and Ontario all have more COVID-19 patients in their ICUs now than at any other time through this pandemic. That's something, that's a detail that's worth noting. Meantime, to our neighbors in the South, the number of new COVID-19 cases in the U.S. has it has reached what Dr. Anthony Fauci is calling a disturbingly high level. He says America is at risk from a new surge as well. 61,000 new cases reported yesterday, according to data from Johns Hopkins University. And as is the trend in Canada as well, we heard this from Dr. Kashif Prasada yesterday. More and more young patients are showing up in hospital in their 30s, in their 40s, including in the ICUs. And that's a story that we will continue to monitor well it's a solemn day today it's a solemn day for the millions and millions of people that observe the jewish faith around the world yom hashoah is holocaust remembrance day and observations of today uh, are carrying out including here in the province of alberta I'm looking forward to a conversation that, of course, will be heavy, but I have no doubt will be of value to every single person that that hears us uh, chat with our next three guests, regardless of your faith background, regardless of where in Canada or around the world you're watching or listening to this from. We can all recognize the devastating impact of the Holocaust and the resurgence of anti-Semitism. We're seeing it in many cases right here in our very own communities. Stacy Levitt Wright is the CEO of the Jewish Federation of Edmonton. She's making her Real Talk debut today, and I'm very grateful to have her here. She's joined as well by Marnie Bondar, uh, who's been leading up Holocaust education with a, a multitude of programs in Calgary. Uh, Marnie's a second-generation survivor who has used her family's story to educate countless people Colin Muscat is new to the role of Holocaust Education Chair with the Jewish Federation of Edmonton. He's an emergency physician, uh, and he's involved with March of the Living Alumni, which we'll get into. I want to welcome the three of you to the show today, and thank you for being here. Thanks for, thank having, you us. for having us. Thank you for having us. Well, Stacy, why don't why don't we begin with you? Uh, the significance of today, it, I, I don't want to take it for granted that everybody understands uh, what today is all about, why it's so important. Um, it's been mandated. It's been law in Israel since the 1950s. Can you take us into the, the significance of today of Yom HaShoah? Thank you, Ryan. And you gave us a, a good start with that. It's a day of Holocaust remembrance and reflection to honor the six million people, who, men, women, and children who have perished during the Holocaust, as well as the survivors that we want to honor their them and their legacies. The true name that is not as well known is Yom HaShoah Hagavura, which is a day of remembrance of Holocaust uh, remembrance and heroism and the day was chosen to coincide with the anniversary of the uprising in the warsaw ghetto which is the largest jewish resistance against the nazis that happened during the holocaust so it truly is a day of bravery as well how do you uh approach today uh when when Marnie, we talk about your family, and I, I was doing some some reading and preparing for this conversation about your family's story, and it's uh, I don't even know how to begin to wrap my mind around it. But but you have publicly shared it uh, for many years in in a most powerful sense. Uh, how do you approach today? You know, it's interesting to hear you say uh, to introduce it that way because for me, very much. 
I'm continuing the legacy uh, that was started by my bubby. That's the Jewish word for grandmother, my bubby Frida. I'm actually the granddaughter of four Holocaust survivors. And the person that I usually share the most about is my bubby Frida. And my bubby Frida spent years and years educating Alberta youth about her Holocaust experience. And so today, what I end up thinking about the most is the fact that we truly are going to be in a world without Holocaust survivors very soon. We are losing that first-hand knowledge, that first-hand approach of, I was there, I saw it, I remember what happened. And I feel personally uh, an enormous sense of weight and responsibility, but also honor in ensuring the legacy personally that my bubby Frida is shared, but that the legacy and testimonies of all of our Holocaust survivors are shared. Doctor, I'm uh, grateful. My, my understanding, first, let me recognize, my understanding is that you're joining us on the heels of a night shift. Uh, so I'm, great, <laughs> I'm grateful that you were able to be here. And, and on behalf of my fellow Albertans, let me thank you for, for your service to public health. Let me thank you for your service to health care. Um, I guess that means maybe in a way that, that, that today, um, maybe you feel a little bit emotionally tapped having, having worked through the night. It's, it's an emotional day. It's a heavy day. How do you approach it? Yeah, I think I think you're right. Um, I when uh, we first viewed the commemoration that um, that we're going to premiere tonight, when we we first viewed the first edit, I, I was coming off a night shift, and um, it made it especially emotional. And I found myself actually in tears pretty early in in the, the presentation. So maybe it actually kind of helps uh, to be a bit sleep deprived in order to, uh, I guess, um, enhance the feelings. Hmm. You're, you're, you've stepped into a, a relatively new role, is my understanding, is uh, in, in Holocaust education. Um, what, what was it that, uh, I mean, was there sort of a personal sense here? Was there a personal connection to the story? Was it just simply a greater awareness of the obvious importance of this education? What, what drew you to this role? Um, I think I, I would say first I was asked, um, <laughs> so, the, so, but it, it's something that, um, I was very glad to take, uh, take up, um, Holocaust education and, and human rights in, in general, it are just something that I, I care quite a bit about. And, um, I had a very formative experience, um, earlier in my life when I was about 17, uh, when I was, um, lucky enough to be a participant on a program called the March of the Living, uh, just in, in brief, the program takes um, Jewish high school students and uh, takes them to Poland to visit the remnants of the death camps, as well as other Holocaust historical sites and, and monuments. And um, even, you know, however many years later, I still feel that as somewhat of a witness to what happened there, I do feel a responsibility to be an active participant in Holocaust education. On our live chat, we have a uh, an audience member this morning that that says, you know, we had an opportunity to hear from a survivor. Uh, this is Scott, who says he met uh, Eva Olson about five years ago, says, uh, look at this. It looks to me like the three of you recognize the voice. Scott says she did a presentation at our school. Uh, she was at Auschwitz and never have I seen our students so respectful, so emotionally touched. Uh, Scott says what a beautiful human uh, she is. Stacy, do you do do today's young people, or or for that matter, adults today, do you think grasp the significance of 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 this devastating time in human history? Relatively speaking, in my mind, relatively recently, do you think that it resonates with people, especially young people? I think when we do hold our educational symposiums and reach out to the high schoolers, they are deeply touched. And it does resonate and the messages of not hating and recognizing the signs that lead towards a genocide definitely resonates. But the statistics right now are a little frightening. Uh, the polls showing that 62% of millennials uh, don't know about the Holocaust, can't name a concentration camp. 
Uh, 45% of Americans cannot name a concentration camp. 54% of Canadians overall polled are unaware that 6 million Jewish people were killed during the Holocaust. So that, that's a little frightening to me and, and speaks to the need for more of this education and witnessing these stories. And at the same time, and, and perhaps the two are related, or, or maybe I can even say undeniably the two might be related, we see incidents of anti-Semitism on the rise. I mean, groups like B'nai B'rith, I know, have been have been compiling statistics and do annual reports. Uh, Marnie, is this something that's been on your radar? I mean, have, is this something that, that is really giving you pause to think over the past year or two or five? Absolutely. Um I think the reality is, is that for me, uh, the Holocaust is not ancient history. Uh, and the same poisons of racism and anti-Semitism that led to the systematic mass murder of 6 million Jews and others, are they still exist today. And we hear a lot of the same tropes about uh, Jews being played out, that Jews control, you know, uh, vast amounts of money and are responsible for conspiracy theories and all sorts of things. Um, it still exists today. I know that when I go into classrooms and I speak to kids or lately have been doing it uh, for the last year online, the kids are aware of it as well. And uh, they're very uh, concerned and uh, I'm appreciative of the support. Um, I certainly feel the anti-Semitism, 100%. You know, Ryan, uh, they, we say that uh, what starts with the Jews uh, does not end with the Jews. It's uh, although the incidences of anti-Semitism have risen, we see hate in general. And so we are concerned for you know, the women in hijab in Edmonton who are being attacked, the Asians being targeted on the streets. And one of the key messages that Eva Olson has imparted to thousands in Alberta alone is to say no to hate, to not use the word hate, and to be aware of it when it's occurring. What do you think driving it? Dr. Muscat, maybe I'll, maybe I'll begin with you. I mean, uh, first of all, are you seeing it firsthand? Um, and what do you think is the root of this? Um, I, I'm not sure I see much of anything firsthand anymore besides the hospital and home, to be honest. Um, I would say there almost seems to be this phenomenon of these extreme and racist beliefs um, coming more into the mainstream and almost um, people being comfortable coming in from the fringe. And I think that is, that is quite concerning. And I don't know if it has to do with the rise of, of populism in the world right now, um, but it, it's definitely something that, that concerns me. Stacy, what do you think is the root of it? I mean, I guess I actually it's, that's, it's, that, that's a huge question is the root of it. I mean, the root of it is, is, is thousands and thousands of years of human history. But, but what do you think's going on? You know, people are stressed. People are anxious. The world is uh, one that's uh, outside of our, our grasp right now. You know, everything is kind of the, the rug's been pulled out from under us. And I think they're... Um, looking for uh, quick and easy answers, I guess. Um, the tropes are, as Marnie was saying, uh, age old and uh, certainly resurrect and come back. And uh, with the rise of populism, as Colin just said, uh, it's not surprising. So Stacy, this is, uh, um, you know, obviously I think there, there are, there's community leadership that we see, and, and the three of you here are, are examples of community leaders that are doing their part when it comes to, to Holocaust education and to, uh, to ensuring that, that members of the Jewish faith, as well as those uh, of different backgrounds, you know, completely understand, I think, the importance of, of speaking in solidarity. And then there's the everyday stuff, right? There's the everyday conversations that happen among people. Um, the, you know, the interactions and, and, and as Dr. Muscat so, so aptly pointed out, there's, there's fewer personal action, you know, interactions now than but but we are confident we are optimistic we'll get back to that on a day like today, a very significant day. But then tomorrow and the day after and the next week and the next year, where do you hope that these conversations are going? Where do you hope that the focus is? How do you hope that that people are challenging one another? 
Stacy, I'll take a stab. Yeah. I'll take a stab at that. You know, I, I have children who are teenagers in high school, and they've you know experienced by ignorance, uh, mostly not necessarily malice comments and anti-Semitic comments uh, here and there. And I think that education is really where it's at. That we really need to focus on how we're educating our youth and having thoughtful conversations about what it is we're truly talking about. And I think uh, the lessons from the Holocaust are universal. The, the talk about genocide, recognizing the signs of it arising, recognizing where hate exists and having uh, thoughtful conversations that are based in facts is, is the starting point to address that. Marnie, I'm, I'm hoping that that, you know, we we can ask. I mean, you obviously had as as the grandchild of four Holocaust survivors. I mean, a perspective that you would have gleaned from that, that, that very few people, uh, you know, I mean, it's obviously a reality that no one would wish on anyone. But at the same time, very few people, I would imagine, could relate to the perspectives that your grandparents would have shared and that they the wisdom that they've imparted to you. And now this wisdom you share with people. Um, I wanted to draw attention, if I can, uh, before I ask you about what your grandparents would tell you uh, to, to the Auschwitz Memorial, the Auschwitz Museum Twitter account. And Sam, let's put it up on the screens here. They're, they're, they're obviously uh, tweeting today in, in, in many different ways. And, 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 and throughout the year, they share the stories of uh, they share the stories Sorry, of Holocaust like survivors. I, I don't have a connection. Uh, to your don't worry about it, buddy. Right uh, yep. So Auschwitz Memorial um, today tweeting memory comes in many forms. And here on Twitter, they say it is in your hands. And on Yom HaShoah, we kindly ask you to amplify our voice. And they encourage you to follow them on Twitter. And they tell the stories of, uh, uh, of Deborah Strasberg, for an example. They post her photo, people can see. Um, born uh, in Nerol, emigrated to Belgium in 1932 at 10 years of age. In 1942, she was deported to Auschwitz. She was murdered in a gas chamber at 10 years old. They tell the stories of others. I mean, the millions and millions and millions of people that were there. They say each year the museum leads the nation in observing days of remembrance. These stories, these are personal stories of young children, of mothers, of fathers, of grandparents, of families torn apart in some remarkable circumstances of families united years later um, in, in the most unlikely circumstances. These stories that you used to hear around the family table, I mean, would, would you share one with us? Would you give us a sense? I would imagine you heard about resilience in, in a context that most people could just simply not wrap their minds around. It would be my honor. Um, my Bubby Frida was actually 17 years old when the Second World War broke out and Germany invaded Poland. Um, but even in the years preceding the war, my Bubby Frieda used to share with us uh, many experiences that she had experiencing anti-Semitism as a kid. She was often called dirty Jew by the other Polish kids that she went to school with. She was physically beaten for her culture and her religion. After uh, the Nazis invaded Poland, uh, life for my Bubby Frida quickly changed and uh, she ended up in a ghetto with a portion of her family. And uh, I think uh, the testimony I want to share with you today is actually very appropriate for Yom HaShoah because it is a story of exactly that, resilience and bravery. Bravery by my Bubby Frida's sister, but also my Bubby Frida. Stories started coming into the ghetto. This, she was in the ghetto in, uh, in a town called Gustinin in Poland. And stories were coming in about Jews from other ghettos being forced out of the ghetto walls and being ordered to dig their own graves before they were shot. And my Bubby Frida's family started to fear for the day that the same fate would happen to the Jews in the ghetto in Gustinin. And so my Bubby Frida had another sister named Sala. And Sala begged my Bubby, sister, Bubby Frida to escape, to run, to go somewhere, to, to try to survive. And my Bubby Frida was young. She was scared. She'd never been by herself before. She was the baby of the family. And uh, on that last night, my Bubby Frida's father actually decided to recite the Kaddish. The Kaddish 
is a deeply ancient, meaningful Jewish prayer that is recited over the dead. And when asked, why are you reciting the Kaddish? My Babi Frida's father explained that he didn't think that anyone would be alive in the coming days to be able to say it for the family. And so my Babi Frida, having heard her father just recite the Kaddish and being prompted by her eldest sister, Sala, who begged her to be the one to escape, my Babi Frida decided to risk everything and they waited. She and her oldest sister, Sala, waited to nightfall. And when they thought no one was looking, they walked to the edge of the ghetto and her sister held up the barbed wire so that my Bubby Frida could dive underneath and run to a nearby forest. My Bubby Frida's sister, Sala, saved my Bubby Frida's life that day and many, many more times throughout the war. My Bubby never saw her parents again after that day or her grandparents or Sala or her nieces. But there were many times when my Bubby Frida was in Auschwitz. My Bubby was there for two years. When she thought about going and touching the live electric wire that surrounded the camp. She thought about suicide many times, but many, many more times, she thought about what her eldest sister Sala had told her, that she would be the one to live to tell the story of what happened to the family. That's just, <clears throat> I, thank you for sharing that. Heidi's watching and she says, Roberto Benigni's film, Life is Beautiful, is an annual affair. She says in our home, um, it's horrifying and it's funny and it's sad and it's hopeful. And Heidi says, and I basically weep through the entire thing every single time. Um, Stacy, I feel like I can see it on your face. And this is like, you know, Bobby Frieda is, 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 is one I know. And I'm sitting here going, I feel like as the moderator of this conversation, I'm supposed to have something to offer here. But that just that is just such a there are so many levels there to wrap your mind around. I mean, I even think, for example, of the what we understand now about trauma and PTSD and, and what we did not understand in the 1930s and the 1940s and the 50s and 60s and, and, and how many survivors um, in, in some circumstances still walk the face of this earth with such a heavy burden. I mean, these are the things that it's so important that we think about today. Bearing witness is, is so important and sitting with people in their pain, which is intergenerational for sure. Uh, when we did a preview of the, the ceremony, as Colin was saying, you know, typically our ceremony is, is focused on the prayers and readings. And this year he added a very personal touch to it by having uh, some survivors tell a little bit of their story and be there with their generations that followed them. And one of our survivors who is 96 years old, you know, so think of how many years she's been through this, uh, spoke to us when she was a teenager coming back to her house and the seven family members were no longer there. And, and she just broke down in tears. And, and the rest of us did too watching this. I mean, just seeing that it was as if she was still there that day you know, that, that deep pain uh, that she was feeling. And, and that carries through generations. Doctor, when people talk about never again, it's, and, and, and that, as a matter of fact, the, the hashtag is, is trending today. Two of them are never again and never forget, I've noticed. But what, what, what does that mean to you? Like, I, I understand what it means in, in your context and, and, and as part of your journey and, and your volunteer efforts here and with regards to, to Holocaust education. But as a society... Uh, as, as a human race, how do you interpret that? Um, I think one of, one of the, the most important messages and lessons of the Holocaust is that I think in order for something that extreme to happen, the public needs to be apathetic at best and complicit at worst. And I think that we have to do better in standing against racism and extremism and do better to educate 
um, each other about the consequences of how we speak and how we act and how we spread information. And that in the progression of what happened in Nazi Germany, it started with step one and ended with the Holocaust. And so there are many steps in between there. And I think we have to think as a society, where are we right now? And what can we do to prevent this from ever happening again to anybody? And I think that's what never again means to me. What does it mean to you, Stacey? Um, never again, uh, I says the leader of a, a Jewish communal organization means that we are going to ensure that our community uh, is there to stand up to assist other communities who are going through some of the similar issues that we have been experiencing with racism and hate, and to ensure that the generations uh, that are following are going to be aware, who are going to bear witness and continue to learn about the, the history that is so important here. Hmm. I, this is uh, an oft quoted, uh, described as a post-war confessional poem. Um, I'm sure that you can all guess w- what I'm going to read, but it, it just, I think, is is so relevant to what you just said, Stacey. Uh, Lutheran pastor, the, the uh, German pastor Martin Niemöller, uh, who passed away in 1984, uh, wrote, first they came for the socialists and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. And then they came for the trade unionists. And I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. And then they came for the Jews and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came for me and there was no one left to speak for me. And that poem, I, I, I think, uh, unfortunately, I'm, I'm seeing it invoked more and more fre- frequently, Marnie, um, because of the, the exact things that we're talking about here. Because I think most people understand that the Holocaust did not immediately happen. It did not It did not introduce itself to, to the German and Austrian people, to the citizens of the world as Auschwitz on the first day. Uh, it, be, it began with attitudes toward people. It began with derogatory phrases. It began with discrimination. It began with yellow armbands. It began with people reporting their neighbors, right? And, and, and then we see in a relatively... Uh, I, I don't know why I'm feel, I feel like I have to say this so carefully, but the fact is, in a relative, in a civilized society, and it actually was not that long ago, th- this wasn't a thousand years ago, this wasn't ten thousand years ago, uh, this was less than a hundred years ago. It happened, and millions of people, quite frankly, allowed it to happen. Yeah, yeah, and I think that it's a really good opportunity to talk exactly about the bravery of our. Alberta Holocaust survivors and what it has taken for them to have to go through this entire experience of having been through the Holocaust and lost so many family members. And then, as you were talking about before, alluding to, um, they come out and the war's just finished. And nobody's talking about post-traumatic stress disorder. Nobody's saying, hey, do you need some help? Talking about what you've been through. Everybody had just been through a world war. And so our survivors were sort of taught to lock it up and move on with their lives. And many of our survivors were able to do that. Many of our survivors were not. But I think it's really important to think about what was going on for them in terms of knowing that history. When we look back even to what was happening in Alberta back in the 1980s, when we all learned about Jim Keekstra, what was going on in Alberta when we had an Eckville, Alberta social studies teacher and mayor who was teaching Holocaust denial and had been teaching Holocaust denial for over a decade to students. It was because of that, that our Alberta Holocaust survivors started to speak up Hmm. and had to get the wherewithal to get to that place where they could say, no, no, I was there and I need to tell you what happened to me so that this doesn't happen again. And we're fortunate this year is gonna be our 37th year that our annual Holocaust symposium is running. But I can only imagine how it feels for them now with the increased levels of anti-Semitism. And without a doubt, there is a need and a fierce force 
at work in terms of our willingness and ability to get up and share our Holocaust survivors' experiences now that they are no longer able to do so. Uh, I'm seeing, um, you know, some pretty powerful feedback here from people that are watching or listening to this live. And we know that more and more people will be hearing this interview in, in later today and in the days to come. Corrine says, I just want to thank you all so much for sharing your wisdom, uh, for sharing the history that we need to always remember the the numbers that you've discussed. People unaware of, of concentration camps and Holocaust survivors is disappointing. We must continue to educate and engage youth in this history that is so pertinent to us all that from Corrine, probably a good time to talk about opportunities that people will have even today and into this evening to, to better understand this and to participate, uh, to gather in, in some way, shape or form in community, um, at jewishedmonton.org. Uh, people can learn more about this, uh, Colin or Stacy, do you want to tell us about what's, what's going on here? Um, I'll, I'll take it. Um, so, um, we are having a Yom HaShoah commemoration. It's virtual. I believe it's on a YouTube platform and it's going to be tonight at 7 p.m. Um, we'd like to invite your viewers to join us if they'd like and they can register at jewishedmonton.org and click on the legacy keeping the flame alive button. Um, this production is going to feature Edmonton Holocaust survivors and their family. So it has a very uh, local uh, flavor to it. And as Stacy mentioned, it's, it's kind of our pandemic take on an annual commemoration ceremony that's usually done together and outside. So our, our goals in this uh, presentation are to honor the memories of those who were killed as well as those who survived. And it deals with the theme of passing down the responsibility to remember the Holocaust to future generations. Um, one of, I think, the interesting ways that we kind of captured this is by uh, filming conversation between uh, different generations of a survivor's family. And it'll, it'll show kind of how, um, how their families of, of survivors learned about their parents' and grandparents' stories and how um, they plan to pass on this, generation, this knowledge to the next generation once our generations of survivors have passed away. So we think we've, we've put something together that... Um, is uh, hopefully going to um, provoke some uh, emotion and, and be engaging. And we would, we would love um, for your viewers to join us if they'd like to. Well, we appreciate that very much. Um, I've got an interesting question here from, from Genevieve. This is a matter of opinion, I think, but I'd be curious to know. I mean, I know that there are parents uh, making up this panel. Genevieve says, you know, I watched Schindler's List uh, when it first came out. She said I was in grade nine um, and I'd like to watch it with my daughter is grade nine still about the right age. I mean, one of the remarkable things about, I mean, what we have to consider here is that um, tragically, uh, children w were, were a big part of the population in these camps. Um, the, the, the six million plus people that were murdered, uh, Jews, uh, many of them were children. Uh, we've just heard the name of just one 10 year old. That's one. Um, where do you all land on that, on, on sort of the age appropriate? How do, you, how do you talk about this to a child? Yeah, and we've been doing this uh, for many years. And the reality is, is it starts pretty young. Our Jewish kids definitely learn about the Holocaust probably <laughs> from a very young age. Hmm. In terms of the presentations that we do for uh, our youth, we generally speak to kids uh, anywhere from grade six to grade 12. With that being said, definitely uh, we highlight different stories depending on the age and we also work in conjunction with the teachers. And I just want to applaud a lot of our, our Alberta teachers because um, it's up to them to choose whether to teach the Holocaust or not and some do it such great service and we're very appreciative for the support. Some of the younger grades, grade six, seven, they might hear about the Holocaust. And for those groups, we would share maybe more of the stories of hiding. For example, uh, what it would have been like to be a Jew who had to hide in France for a, for a two year period. 
as the kids are in the older grades, we usually take them to talk about uh, maybe some of the other uh, Holocaust experiences like the concentration camps, or for example, one of the things that's far less known is the Holocaust by bullets, where 1.5 million Eastern European Jews were killed by bullets uh, in mass graves. There's over 2,500 mass graves, they think, in Eastern Europe, and they've only found about just over 1,700 of them. So in answer to the question, yeah, grade nine is absolutely appropriate. Um, the place that I always uh, direct people, because it is absolutely the, the, they are the experts in all things Holocaust, is Yad Vashem, which is the World Holocaust Center. And they have incredible resources and programs available. Um, and also, uh, there's a website, Echoes and Reflections, that's available for any teacher or parent that's interested in actually coming up with lesson plans uh, about how do we talk about some of these really difficult topics, like what it takes to be a perpetrator or a bystander. I love this from Kim, who uh, is watching live. She says, I'm so thrilled with all three of my girls' social studies teachers every year. They've learned enough to be aware and to know about the Holocaust, about residential schools, about so many other, other acts of hate, uh, both past and present. Um, I want to let the three of you uh, perhaps give us an, an opportunity. We often ask for, a, for a, a call to action or something to walk with or something to think about today. And I'd and I'd, li I'd like to ask all three of you to put something in front of us, if you could. I know I'm putting you on the spot a little bit, but but Dr. Muscat, maybe we'll, maybe we'll go with you first. I'm just going to reiterate what I said, is that in order for something this terrible to happen, the public needs to be apathetic about it. And we have to not be apathetic. We have to stand up when we see examples of racism and extremism, and we have to take care of each other. Stacy. On a day where we say never to forget the Holocaust, the Yom HaShoah, I would say uh, educate yourself, uh, read a new book, uh, visit uh, uh, reputed websites such as Yad Vashem to learn some more stories or a different angle that you may not have been aware of. And, and this would be the time to do that. Marnie, we'll give last word to you. If it's all right, I actually kind of want to give it to my bubby Frida. Hmm. And what I want to share with you is this. For the majority of her time in Auschwitz, my buddy Frida actually worked in an area called Canada. And in Canada, it was my buddy Frida's job to separate pants from shirts, separating different types of clothing. And her job was to go through the pockets of the clothing that she was sorting and turn over anything that she found of any value to the Nazis to further the German war effort. Lots of times what my Bubby Frida actually found in the clothing that she went through was food. And so years and years later, when my Bubby Frida ended up learning and figuring out that there was an actual country called Canada, she knew that it was the place that she needed to move to because it was a word that she had always associated with abundance and wealth because it was the place where she'd always been able to find food. And I'm sharing that because I wanna leave everyone with a message of hope. When I go into schools or I hear from kids online, our kids get it, they understand it, and they understand the importance of treating each other with a base level of respect and tolerance. Hmm. We have much to learn from them and we have much to learn from our survivors. Thank you to the three of you so sincerely uh, for this. And uh, on behalf of this audience, we so appreciate your perspective on such an important day. Uh, Marnie Bondar, Stacey Levitt-Wright, and uh, Dr. Colin Muscat. We'll speak with you again soon. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Ryan, Thank you. for having us. Here's another tweet I wanted to mention um, from the Auschwitz Memorial account um, at Auschwitz Museum. If you're watching this on YouTube, you can see it. I can describe it for you if you're listening to the podcast. It's the wire frames and some of the glass lenses of thousands and thousands of pairs of eyeglasses, uh, prescription eyeglasses, piled together. 
the, the, the metal interwoven and mangled and, and smashed and thousands and thousands of pairs that used to adorn the faces of people who were killed in cold blood. So reads the tweet with the photo today from Auschwitz Museum. If you say never forget and never again think, what has my reaction been as a bystander to evil? What is my responsibility in turning the world into a place free of hatred and indifference? What can I do to make it a better and safer place? And then start doing it now. I think it's a great challenge for all of us today on Yom HaShoah. I want to take this opportunity to remind you that conversations, important ones like this, happen because we have the support of sponsors that bring real talk to the podcast platforms and to YouTube every single day. And that includes the team at Eden Landscaping. This is the time of year where they're taking the plans that they're drawing up for their partners and they're turning them into reality. That's right. You don't have to hire a landscape architect and then hire the construction team to make that a reality. Eden Landscaping does it all, and you can check out their work more than 20 years worth at landscapeedmonton.ca. Is it a swim spa this year for you? Is it a fire pit with that interlocking brick that looks so good? Maybe you need to get that retaining wall fixed or maybe a water feature? They've seen it all. They can do it all at Eden Landscaping. The team at St. Albert and Sherwood Dodge is ready to introduce you to Alberta's best selection of the Ram truck lineup as well as the 2021 Jeeps. That includes the return of the Grand Wagoneer, the luxury SUV that's got everybody talking this year. If you're looking at an Escalade or a Navigator or an X5, Make sure you check out the Jeep Grand Wagoneer at St. Albert and Sherwood Dodge. Also want to remind you that the team at Local Waste is, well, they're buckled up, ready to go for tomorrow's edition of Trash Talk. And our inbox is packed, but we're still taking submissions. What do you need to get off your chest? Send us your rant to talk at ryanjesperson.com. Local Waste loves to talk trash, and they'd love to earn your business. Whether you're a small business or a big mall or a hotel They do it all, waste management, garbage and recycling. They have been for a quarter century, and they love when you call them by their first names. Chris, Lauren, Mikkel, you can find all their information at localwaste.ca and give them a call today. That's also the deal with the team at Westworld Computers, first name basis, family business, owned and operated locally for more than 40 years. Daryl and his team are ready to showcase to you the brand new Apple lineup, the MacBook Pro that I'm using, the iMac that Sam's using, the iPhones, the Apple watches the ipads but if budget's a concern right now like it is for so many people they've got their gently pre-owned lineup with the software reloaded and the warranty reinstalled so you can buy with confidence instead of buying on kijiji go take a look at westworld computers we've had a ton of action uh when it comes to our inbox and we appreciate the so many of you that have been taking the time to check in with us and that includes conversations around recent developments Here in our home province of Alberta, you may have heard uh, over the weekend a couple of disturbing stories. Uh, One of them, opposition MLA David Shepard tweeting that he had somebody show up to the door of his home uh, to ring the doorbell, to put him on the spot, to record him as he as as this individual demanded answers on on whether or not Mr. Shepard was a socialist. He went on and on and. And of course, as part of his testimony on Twitter, explained how inappropriate this is. Then we hear from the province's education minister, the Honorable Adriana LaGrange, who tweets yesterday that a rock was thrown through the window of her constituency office. Obviously, totally unacceptable. It prompted an interesting letter from Krista, who wrote to the education minister and CC'd us on the email. And I wanted to share it with you. Krista said, Minister LaGrange, I, I, I just read that a large rock was thrown through your constituency office window. This is reprehensible. Violence, vandalism, and property destruction and damage are totally unacceptable. I do not condone nor support such behavior or action, and I am relieved to hear that no one was harmed. Please accept my apologies for this destructive and harmful behavior on behalf of the tens of thousands of Albertans who are trying to submit their feedback in an appropriate way. 
There are grave and significant issues at play in our schools right now, and those presented to us in the form of this kindergarten through grade six draft curriculum. Clear, carefully constructed feedback is flooding your office, no doubt, via email, phone calls and messages, written letters, electronic survey submissions and petitions. Indigenous groups, the Alberta Association of Deans of Education, and at least five school districts and thousands of educators and experts and psychologists and parents and Albertans have already shared the most basic form of feedback. We do not support the draft curriculum and we refuse to pilot it in this form. Your response was to threaten the people of the province with the information that only schools that pilot the draft curriculum would be allowed to provide feedback. How convenient. Only accept feedback from those who support you. That's what we call an echo chamber. It's not an ethical communication process. Walking into your office this morning and seeing the destruction there must have been horrific. You must have felt shocked, concerned, violated, and angry. Fear of the well-being of your staff and yourself likely quickly followed. Looking around your place of work, seeing it glass and shambles, the knowledge that the actions of another person or another group of people could have seriously harmed those close to you likely left you furious and desperate for resolution. Krista wonders, can you imagine that you called the authorities and that they would only accept communication from other police officers or other supporters? Can you imagine if your building manager told you that there was no budget to replace the window? What about if you were left with shattered glass around you? No new window would be installed and the authorities meant to help turned a blind eye to the attack on your place of work and the people with whom you work. Your draft curriculum is the rock and you, minister, have thrown it through Alberta's window. Krista says it's a relief to know that no one in your office was harmed today. I cannot say the children of this province will be so fortunate should this curriculum be implemented in our schools. Take the action to do what is right or resign. That from Krista, who signs off as a mother, an educator, and an Albertan. It's a powerful letter and an interesting metaphor. Sam, I was troubled with both of those instances, the rock through the window of Adriana LaGrange, the individual, the constituent showing up on the, on the doorstep of the private and personal residence of, of MLA David Shepard, I wondered if maybe you and I are on this show. We need to bring somebody on to talk about kind of the basics of decent communication. Like like Krista just wrote, thousands of people trying to submit feedback appropriately. Yeah, and, and I think that there is a... Man, this is a lot to unpack here. Um, first of all, I, I agree with you. Both Both instances are reprehensible. Like, I'm sorry... You can dislike an elected official, but they're still an elected official. They're still somebody that works for you as part of the government. And elected official or not, you don't go throw rocks through people's windows. You don't go intimidate people on their front porch. Like, that's just, it is a testament to how horribly polarized things are right now, I think. And, and, I don't really know what the solution is. Uh, does Adrienne LaGrange deserve to be education minister? Yeah, probably not. Does she deserve to have a rock thrown through her office window? Also, probably not. In fact, definitely, definitely not. Definitely not, yeah. You know, so it's, I, I just, I think part of the problem that, that Albertans are feeling with this frustration, and this doesn't excuse any projectiles through any windows, is that, you know, this is a government that outright shuts down any discourse that is critical to them. And I mean, even our show is a really good example of that. We're we're the one media outlet that is banned from the government to speak to. So well, you know. I don't know about that actually. Oh, okay. I'm, I'm starting to see more. I'm starting to see. Uh, you know, I mean, that's like you know, we're maybe the highest profile one because it's <laughs> it's it's been made very clear. And and uh, I mean, there's a lot of backstory to that that we don't need to get into. But but, but you yeah, you won't point. hear you won't hear Premier Jason Kenney on this show, and it's not because he's not invited. Um, we're, we're oftentimes uh, in touch with the government to re reiterate that the door is open okay but this is a but this is uh it's a style of com- it's a style of government communication of inaccessibility it is and we've seen a trend of a, of a failure uh when it comes to the duty to consult and i think it's actually kind of ironic there's a lot of irony at play but it's ironic because if you look at the drum that the conservatives banged in opposition for the years that rachel notley was premier 
uh, most especially uh, when Jason Kenney came on as, as leader of the PCs and then leader of the United Conservatives. So much of that focused on the NDP's lack of consultation when it came specifically to Bill 6, to what you might call the farm safety bill. So, so that, to me, is where there's a real breakdown. I think so. And, and I also think that it's, I mean, first of all, they haven't stopped beating that drum. I mean, I, I think a lot of people actually agree that, like, the UCP never left opposition. Like, congratulations, you're the government right now. They're still acting like they're the opposition. They're the opposition to Ottawa, and they're the opposition to the NDP, who are actually the opposition. So, I mean, that's a bit of a weird dynamic. But you're right. It, it's the precedent that they've set up here is massively hypocritical to what they said when they were in opposition, because... They do consultation with their friends. They do consultation with people that are close to them. And quite frankly, they get, do consultation with the people that will give them the answers that they want. And that not, doesn't just extend to curriculum. That doesn't extend to just healthcare negotiations. You know, I mean, that extends to things like the McKinnon panel. Like, we all know that that was 100% laid out to get a certain answer to a very specific question. Yeah, you're talking about the blue ribbon panel. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. You know, th that exercise was conducted so that they would get the result of, we're spending too much. You know what I mean? Like, that was that was the foregone conclusion, and now they have a little bit of data to back it up. They consulted people that are friendly to them to get the answer they wanted. Mm. Yeah, you know, one of the things I think that's, that's unfortunate about, you know, for example, one example, which should be, throwing a rock through a window of the education minister uh, is that it takes away, it, it provides ammunition for the government to, to essentially say, look what's happening to us. Look at how people are treating us. Look at these hooligans where, where like our letter writers said, people are doing everything they can within the parameters of what's acceptable to do this in reputable fashion, to write the emails, to make the phone calls, to write the handwritten letters, to participate in the political process, to take the surveys, to provide the feedback. And a rock through the window takes away so much of the momentum that people are building. It delegitimizes to a certain degree, not even close to completely, but to a certain degree, it delegitimizes what so many people are putting a lot of effort into. It's a very short step to the argument of these thousands of letters I'm receiving are the same people that throw rocks through me, my window, so I'm going to ignore all of yeah, them. Yeah, these hooligans, yeah, these, exactly. these, these thugs, right? It's the same sort of a thing when you see, when you see movements hijacked. And taken over. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, we, and we've seen it even recently. You would, you would see violent protesters jump in on, on political movements or societal movements. I think, of, for example, Black Lives Matter demonstrations, uh, where a lot of times people would essentially, bad actors, would jump in and, and, and hijack the movement and do a disservice to the movement. And it happens in different contexts, but you see it with the effect of that is and ultimately who it provides power to. And it's, it's relatively counterintuitive. Yeah, I think. Uh, the Yellow Vesters is another really good example of that because the original Yellow Vest movement in France was a grassroots led, you know, protest from a progressive group against some certain taxes that were that were disproportionately affecting people. And and it and it grew because uh, everybody in France is required to carry a yellow or a like a hazard vest in their vehicle in case there's a breakdown. It's actually a law. So everybody's got one. Um, people here just saw protest and fuel tax and took it in the most angry, awful, racist direction you possibly could imagine. Yeah. So you, you have people that in good faith, um, I mean, you know, you talk about, you know, the, the truck convoy that, that came from Alberta to, to uh, Ottawa. But I guarantee I know that a lot of people because I heard from them because people were in touch with me, people that said you're treating this, you're, you're, you're painting this with with an unfair brush, you're you're mischaracterizing this movement. Um, you know, you're talking about you know you're focusing on a lot of the things that are not our focus. People would say, "I'm trying to get back to work. I'm trying to communicate that I don't think that a that a carbon tax or carbon pricing is is the most effective way um, to show the rest of the world that we care about the environment." And so I'm going to Ottawa to send that message. The problem is you've also got people talking about Sharia law and the United Nations and, and saying that Fidel Castro is Justin Trudeau's father. And you've got all these bizarre signs and messages and these people attaching themselves uh, and polluting what I know some people were hoping would be a reputable movement that would catch the government's attention. And the ultimate impact of that was that the entire thing 
was treated like a joke. It was treated like a farce. And for all intents and purposes, it was ignored by media and members of the public and, and ineffective because of those associations. Yeah. I guess the other thing that I just like I have to question is the people that brought talk of Sharia law and posters about Fidel Castro into that movement felt a home there. They felt welcomed in that community. And the leaders did not meaningfully push back against that. Yeah. Well, I think because some of the leaders were sympathetic to some of yeah. those causes. I mean, you know. So I'm not, the uh, whole movement is tainted because they didn't take any steps to distance themselves from that. It's a fair point. Heidi's uh, watching this morning. Uh, she says, I'm very uncomfortable with people vandalizing and approaching politicians in their homes. It is so discouraging, um, especially when it comes to, you know, it's, it's, or Heidi says, rather, it discourages good people to run, um, especially if they have young kids. It is never, ever, ever appropriate to ring somebody's doorbell at their home and talk to them about their job, uh, whether they're a politician, whether they're a professional athlete, whether they're a broadcaster, whatever the case may be, it is never appropriate. You know, maybe they're the CEO of a company where you own some shares and you're going to go ring their doorbell and talk to them at their home. It is never appropriate. And I encourage people to, to do your best to keep it classy so as to not denigrate the movement. Uh, we know for a fact thousands of people are emailing the government. We know because we're, I mean, we have hundreds of them. We're just, we're this independent show, you know? We're just a few guys, you know, we're the team. We put out this show every single day and we've got hundreds of your emails. So imagine on mass the messaging that this government is receiving. Let's ensure that our elected officials receive messages in the right way and keep them, uh, you know, keep, keep, you know, let's refrain from from providing. Uh, let's say I guess what I'm trying to say is let's not nail our feet to the floor. We're going to be talking about coal tomorrow, by the way. The story's been flying under the radar, but it doesn't mean that it's gone away. And it's going to be the subject, uh, if everything works out uh, like it looks like it's going to, the subject of our Real Talk Roundtable coming up tomorrow on Friday. You're not going to want to miss it. It's going to be a big show. As mentioned, we're also going to be getting in uh, to your email sent to talk at ryanjesperson.com, a little something we call trash talk. That's how we'll wrap up the week. Before we sign off today, I wanted to remind you that the Friesen Brothers store in South Edmonton, the one that was on under construction and grabbing so many people's attention there just off rabbit hill road in the anthony henday the doors are open and and it is blowing people's minds including real talkers that are up for a bit of a road trip there's 15 Friesen brothers locations across the province fort saskatchewan's unbelievable stony plains amazing this one in edmonton respectfully it's on a whole other level so whether it's the cinnamon bun corner, whether it's the baker's pantry, whether it's Alberta honey you're looking for, or some of their vegetarian and vegan hot and ready to go options you can take out of their kitchen, Friesen Brothers would love to welcome you. For, for years and years, they have been proudly Alberta grown and Alberta owned at Friesen Brothers. The team at Park Power wants to take over your electricity, internet, and natural gas provision, and they're willing to show you a little money up front, to show you how serious they are about earning your business. If you go to parkpower.ca right now and use the promo code 2021-REALTALK, they're going to give you 70 bucks off your first bill. Make sure you check them out online, by the way, not just at parkpower.ca, but on social media. Their Instagram, I love it. Their Twitter's great, and they highlight some of the nonprofits that they help out as part of their profit-sharing program. Also wanted to remind you that you have a chance to save money and breathe easy thanks to the sponsorship of the team at Clean Air Club. Uh, they've been taking your signups, and so many of you have let us know that you took the simple step of checking what size of furnace filter you need. It's stamped right on the side of the filter. That's the cardboard thing that's stuck into the side of your furnace. You know you're supposed to change it. We all fall behind. I fall behind. But when you pull it out, you'll see how gnarly it is. Your family deserves fresh furnace filters, and you deserve to pay less than you would in stores. You can accomplish both at cleanairclub.ca. So that's a wrap for this Thursday. We want to thank you for tuning in. Thank you for meeting us here for the difficult and heavy and important and meaningful, and we hope sometimes community-changing conversations. It's what drives our process, and we know it's what drives so many of you. 
Have a wonderful Thursday. We'll talk to you tomorrow morning live at 8.30 Mountain Time on Real Talk. They're gonna-